Hello and welcome back. My name is Dr. Christopher Janarian. and this is Great Big History Podcast. In our continuing series on History 102, we do Africa after World War II. So what happens to Africa is decolonization. The Europeans give up control of Africa. Not always easily, not always peacefully, but throughout Africa, the Indian Ocean, and the Pacific Ocean, the European colonies collapse. Europe gives up two, two, gives up control of the world. It's too expensive. And hey, let the Americans do it. The Americans don't want people controlling Africa and India and Southeast Asia. They want locals to control it who can then make treaties with the Americans. And that's pretty much how the Cold War will work. It will be either the United States or the Soviet Union backing one side or another in many of these countries in order to get a ally. Now, white colonists try to stay in charge in places that have high numbers of white colonists, Rhodesia, South Africa, Kenya, Algeria, they all in all of those places, those white colonists, those white settlers tried to stay in charge. In Rhodesia, you had a civil war essentially from the 1960s to 1980. When the uh, African revolutionaries win, and create the country of Zimbabwe. What happens is then whites flee to South Africa. They flee towards the coast. They flee to now that doesn't mean all white people left. They are still the mid uh, for a long time. They were the majority of the large farm owners and best farm land owners, but kind of like white flight in the United States. Most whites are going to flee to South Africa, where they can still remain in charge. Why in South Africa, they get another 15 years. Basically, you have apartheid, which increasingly comes under um, stress and tension until 1992, when Nelson Mandela is elected president. You have truth and conciliation, and that allows the whites to stay. This idea that, and we're going to talk about truth and reconciliation later, the idea that you admit to the crimes, the political crimes you committed, and you are forgiven for them, but you have to admit that one, those crimes happened, and two, you participated in them. So the idea is you can't whitewash history. You can't clear it up. You can't have a lost cause saying the Civil War wasn't caused about slavery. No, it was caused about slavery. It's states' rights to own slaves. That's what the whole point was. That in, you don't get the lost cause narrative. You get what apartheid was. And apartheid was violence. In Kenya, you have the Mau Mau uprising until 1960. This is Barack Obama's father, grandfather. Um, but it's, it's a lot of the men of African men of Kenya. Um, most whites are going to leave and go either to South Africa or to Britain, and they're going to take their wealth with them. So Kenya goes from having a substantial white population to having almost none and goes from being one of the fairly wealthier places in Africa to not. And that's we see this over and over again in the in the they take their investments with them. It's a kind of economic scorched earth tactic. In Algeria. It's the biggest of the fighting. You have a guerrilla terrorist war from 1954 to 1962. It is a very violent war. Algeria was actually part of France. It's kind of the way we consider Hawaii or, or Alaska. It's a non-continuous part of France. And the two million or so French who lived in Algeria didn't want to leave. And the French government didn't want to give it up. And so this... Algerian war is really the start of kind of Islamic terrorism. The tactics that you'll see later, uh, blowing up um, hotels or um, local bus stops, the use of women to smuggle in uh, bombs and weapons because they wouldn't be searched as much as the men. Then you have the, the French responding with the same kind of guerrilla spying torture tactics that you'll see in pretty much every guerrilla war through Iraq in the 2000s. But eventually, Algeria will win in 1962. In fact, its defeat is so traumatic for the French government that the French army actually tried to pull a Franco and invade France 
to take over the government in order to keep Algeria as part of France. Um, it failed. The fourth, the fourth Republic collapsed and France, the French government was only saved because de Gaulle, Charles de Gaulle, the hero of World War II come, came out of retirement, kind of like Washington in 17, you know, 1798 comes out of retirement to kind of save France and create the fifth Republic, which we have now. He, you know, this one guy could come up and go to, you know, no, to the, you know, to the, to the army and the army would go, oh, yeah, you're, you're kind of right. Okay. You know, we followed you for 20 years. We're not going to stop now. Um, but that's how traumatic the Algerian war was for France. And it's something that France has not dealt with. The French consciousness has just not really, it kind of swept it under the rug. Um, and deals more with the 1968 social uprising the, the the you know the paris summer than with the trauma that really is what happened in algeria so what does independence mean independence from 1960 to 1980 is you get an independent country based along the european border lines the europeans made the lines like if you let's go back to the map let's go back we go back to the map look at all those straight lines those don't reflect people. Those don't reflect cultures. They reflect lines on a map. And notice how evenly they line up with areas of control by the different European powers. So it's divided up. It's cut up. And so the result is that ethnicities that lived together were divided and ethnicities that didn't live together were smushed together. We see this especially in West Africa. Nigeria has a Muslim North and a Christian South. We have Mali, Niger, Chad, who are all different ethnicities in different parts of the country. Like They shouldn't be one country. And I'm not going to say like Mali shouldn't exist, but they're not natural. They were put together by French politics. And so what happens is civil war. Almost immediately in many of these places, civil war. Because they didn't have the time to create their own country, to create their own boundaries. Remember, Europe has wars from, well, the end of Charlemagne, from the Vikings, right? So let's call it 1066, the invasion of the Battle of Hastings all the way through World War II, all the way from 1066 to 1945, the borders are changing constantly. And then with the end of the Cold War, the borders kept changing. Yugoslavia collapsed into multiple pieces, for example. And so Europeans had had a thousand years to figure out where did the Germans live? Where did the French live? What, how do you treat Germans living in France or French living in Germany or do any of them live there at all? We've had genocides that we've talked about. We've had pogroms. We've had the mass murder of lots of people and then the movement of the borders. So there's a calm, there's kind of a thing of like, oh, Africa is a mess. Well, dude, Europe has been a mess. I'm a European military historian. I have not yet run out of wars to study. And so what you get is these civil wars, but they're not really civil wars because even though they're a country and they're a war within a country, the country was made by Europeans. And so it's people trying to figure out who will run this new fake bordered country or can we create a new country? So in lots of these places, wealth pulls out. If it's European wealth, they're gone. If they're African wealth, and a lot of times they'll try to move to the United States uh, and to Europe. There's low education. The reason for low education is the Europeans didn't care. The Europeans didn't want to educate. Even though their argument was, we are going to educate, we are going to lift up the, um, the um, white man's burden. That yes, we get to control Africa, but we will make them into modern people. Well. They controlled Africa and they left out that second part. So they have also no bureaucratic experience with the exception of India, Pakistan. India, Pakistan is the one place that had large numbers of native bureaucrats capable of running the show. Part of that is history. The second part is it was so big, the British couldn't run it all on their own. 
They couldn't get away with that. So they had to create an Indian uh, Hindu or Indian Muslim bureaucracy to help them run the show. So that's an exception. But everywhere else, there's no bureaucracy that's ready to take over when the Europeans pull out. And they all have export-oriented economies. They're not economies built for the people who live there. They're dependent on selling stuff to the U.S., to Europe, to USSR. Well, what happens if the U.S., Europe, or USSR has a depression, has a recession? Well, these guys get hurt. The entire economy is built upon producing stuff someone else will buy, not producing stuff for the people who live there. So you could see why that would be a problem. And all of these create unstable states because if anything goes wrong, the whole system falls apart. So you get dictators, you get civil wars, you get these ethnic diversities in fake states that are put together, they're not natural. So the most famous of these is the Congo Zaire civil war in the 1960s, where if you if you listen to um, Billy Joel's We Didn't Start the Fire, this is where he yells out, Belgians in the Congo, because the Belgians left. The, the, the Congoese said, get, get out, we want you out. Now, Congo had suffered in the late 1800s. Remember, they're cutting off the arms for rubber. It is the heart of darkness. It is one of the poorest, even though the land is one of the richest. The Zaire, Congo Zaire could be the richest place in Africa. Easy, just based on the mineral wealth in the ground. And the Belgians didn't want to give it up because it made them so much money. And Belgium's a small country. And so they were kind of resentful. And so the Americans said, you got to leave. Europe said, you got to leave. We got to, we're leaving. We got to leave. So they went, fine, we're out. And he just pulled everything out, expecting Congo to collapse, which is exactly what happened. It collapsed immediately into civil war. And the, Congo, and the Belgians said, oh, well, I guess we have to come back. We're just going to have to run it. So see, our empire just isn't over quite yet. And it was like, no, that's not how it's going to work. But yeah, they reinvaded their, their own colony because they ran it so terribly that they knew it would fail the moment they left. And then they got kicked out, mostly by the Americans. So what do these civil wars look like? The civil wars from the 60s to the 80s are majority versus minority groups. And at times there are genocides that, that happen or genocidal activities. And what you have is a majority trying to oppress the minority or in many places a minority who have more guns trying to oppress the majority. The majority wants a democracy, but as we talked about in India and Pakistan, the problem with, eth the problem with these countries being democracies is that if all the if all the ethnicities vote the same way, then one ethnicity will always win, and you'll have a dictatorship of this ethnic majority. And so the idea is the minority says no, we don't want that, and they have the guns usually because they were working with the Europeans to run the show when the Europeans showed up. Because in back in the day, the majority would have run the show because warfare was based on hand-to-hand -hand combat. And 90% of the time, 95% of the time, he who has more people wins. There are always exceptions, but in most places, the majority, the ethnic majority, overwhelms the ethnic minority. Well, then the Europeans show up, they show up with their guns, and suddenly the minority can run the show. And we see this throughout all over the place, Iraq and Syria. We see this throughout the Middle East. This is how the Europeans run the show. And so what you have is these civil wars that are based on these ethnic groups, ethnic sizes, and it's based on oppression, demographic or violence. It's either demographic uh, oppression if you're the majority, and it's violent oppression if you're the minority because you can't keep in charge any other way. There are a few successful democracies with multiple parties, at least until the 1990s. Ghana and Botswana and South Africa under Mandela. You have strong democracies with low levels of corruption, and all of these countries happen to be success economically. Results. Advantage. Africa is moving in the right direction with less war and less interference. And stronger economic ties with China. 
who are buying the natural resources and developing infrastructure. One of the biggest things China, Chinese uh, investment is doing is actually building roads and bridges and railroads and in Africa, something the USSR and the United States really didn't do. Both of them were more concerned with having an ally than having an economic uh, ex, uh, economic um, colony, so to speak. They were fighting a different kind of war. China needs resources. So it's willing to, to invest to get the resources and hope the politics follows. The disadvantage is China is building infrastructure to benefit China. This is not a bad thing for China. Like, don't, this is not anti-Chinese. Of course they are. They're acting like imperialists. They're building railroads. Yes, those railroads go from the mines to the ports. Can people get on those, use those railroads along the way? Yeah, of course they can. But the purpose of that railroad is not to help connect Tanzania and build infrastructure for Tanzania. No, it's to help export stuff just like Britain built stuff in the 1890s. You also get conservative Islamic terrorism, especially in the Sahel, in the Sahara, and that's creating new loyalties and new identities in um, the Sahara Africa and in East Africa. Some of the earliest things that Osama bin Laden attacked were in East Africa. Climate change is hurting Africa first. And it will hurt it the worst. And Africa cannot affect the outcomes. They do not make enough stuff. They do not put too enough carbon dioxide into the atmosphere to do anything about it, even if it worked as a continent. And of course, you're talking about 50 or so countries that would all have to work together. But even then, Africa is going to be hurt by climate change that is being caused by Europe, United States and China. Freedom, female education, and health are rising, but still low. Huge inequalities between the rich, who have access to global culture, who have access to Europe education, American education, and the poor, who live on $2 a day. You have huge changes since 1985's Live Aid, We Are the World, where white people had to save black folk. The idea was, oh, there's a famine in, in Ethiopia. We Europeans will save them. We'll feed them. Well, we've come a long way to um, ending that kind of uh, paternalism. So, um, so here's our pictures of the We Are the World and USA Africa. And you, you get all these white people like, we will save Africa. And you're like, oi. Um, mineral wealth. Mineral wealth, modern services, and connectivity equal better standards of living if the corrupt government doesn't siphon away the wealth. Siphon the wealth away. And that brings us to uh, kind of the most standout heroic aspect of we want to end on a good point. And that is... Um, Nelson Mandela, the end of apartheid in South Africa. Nelson Mandela was a revolutionary fighter. He was a violent guy. He was imprisoned for 20 years. He was, um, he might have started as a peaceful Gandhi-esque uh, leader, but he turned to violence. And he would tell you he turned to violence. He says he turns to violence because he was forced to, because the apartheid regime responds with violence. So the apartheid is the system of racial control of a majority by a minority. The, the minority race gets all the rights. The majority race gets no rights. And they use terrorism to scare the majority race into accepting this, this situation. That terrorism is the police. It is at times the army. It is vigilantes. So demographics had a huge issue with this. Huge effect. In 1900 through 1960, South Africa was about 70% African and 20% white. The remaining groups being uh, immigrants or Indians, what's it's referred to as Indians, or mixed race, which was coloreds. 
Uh, there are other people who are also classified as colored, C-O-L-O-U-R-E-D, um, who had some rights, and the white majority tried to incorporate them in as kind of a, you're with us, but not really kind of thing. So you have 20 to 25% of the population dominating the politics. By 1990, it's 10% white. It's 77% African. And even with modern weapons, it is not enough white people to control Africa, to control South Africa. If there's a race war, if there's a revolution, uh, you cannot do it. One tenth cannot control, even if they were all united. And there are South Africans who didn't like apartheid, who didn't want apartheid. So even that 11% isn't united in oppressing Native Africans. So apartheid went from acceptable system of segregation, a system we kind of see in Jim Crow America and Northern Ireland, where a majority can oppress the minority even in their own country, or a minority can oppress the majority even in their own country. Um, it was seen as necessary, quote unquote, to protect democracy versus communism, because the idea was Nelson Mandela's groups, the, the uh, ANC, they would go to, they would, since South Africa was un was part of the British Dominion. They were allies with, with Britain. Na and Britain was allied with America. Naturally, naturally, the ANC, the African National Congress, the, the, the Africans of South Africa would, would turn to South Africa, not South Africa, would turn to the USSR, the Soviet Union, for, for help, for aid. And so to protect South Africa with its large gold and diamond mines from going communist, well, we're just going to have to accept apartheid. And it went from acceptable in the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, to a racist system of oppression and disinvestment by the world system. The idea, here's a little picture of Vassar. It's a liberal college in the Northeast. Is it time to divest? Now, we've seen the divestment in other places. Um, most recently, there's been a Palestinian movement to get global corporations to divest uh, in uh, Israel, or at least in the West Bank. If not Israel itself, at least in the West Bank, the Occupy, quote unquote, the Occupy territories. And we've seen it in other places as well. The idea that you make it economically too expensive to maintain the system of oppression. There's a line in Hamilton, in um, Right Hand Man, I think it's Right Hand Man, which is um, to make it too expensive to justify the fight. And that's what the disinvestment tried to do. It tried to make it unpalatable so that big corporations would not sell there, would not build factories there, would not invest money there. So what happens? So Nelson Mandela also changes from this protest leader to, quote, terrorist, to a guy who leads a violent terrorist campaign, to a political prisoner, where he's in prison for 20 years, to a statesman. He comes out of prison as a statesman, wins a Nobel Peace Prize in the early 90s, and becomes this wise African sage that is like, you. there are memes of his quotes all over the place. He's kind of a, an African Dalai Lama. You know, so he goes the whole way from tough, independence, revolutionary, all the way to wise African sage. And a lot of this had to do with the end of the Cold War. It had to do with demographics, and then the Cold War ended. So in 1990, the Cold War is ending, and President de Klerk releases him because it's now a political prisoner, and the United States can no, lo no longer justify it because of the Cold War. So they release him and begin negotiating an, an end to apartheid, an end to the armed struggle, an end to disinvestment, and an end to white power in South Africa. And to do so, unlike in most places, Kenya, Algeria, to do it peacefully. And they do. And they win a Nobel Peace Prize. Both of them win a Nobel Peace Prize in 1993 because they did something that even the United States can't, hasn't done. The United States has not reckoned at all with Jim Crow much less slavery, but hasn't reckoned with Jim Crow segregation. 
the violence of the 50s and the 60s. And the way they did it was Truth and Reconciliation. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission, led by Bishop Desmond Tutu, who also won a Peace Prize in 1984. And the idea was that you are not going to have revenge. You are not going to have retribution. You are not going to go after the people who were in charge. Unless they did something kind of Nuremberg-esque level of violence. But like the police, the, the people who held up the, the, the regular folk who were scared that they would lose. And so they had to accept apartheid. What Truth and Reconciliation said to them was, you have nothing to fear from change. It was to allow people to express the trauma that had happened to them. To tell their truth. To say, I was here and the cops broke down my door and they shot my dog and they killed my father and they arrested me and they never told me what and they tortured me and they did all kinds of things. It also allowed people to admit to their terrorism. Cops, military, spies admitted. Government officials admitted what they did or what they were a part of. Their terrorism, their violence, their wrongdoing. Imagine, you know, we we will talk about this when we do conservatism, but we talk about redlining, which is the disinvestment of banks and government in neighborhoods of black majorities in many cities. Imagine you had the the bank owner or the government official saying, yes, I did redlining. I drew the line and I said we had a committee and I said nobody is going to invest any money in this neighborhood between this block and this block, this avenue and that avenue. That's what Truth and Reconciliation did. It got the bureaucrats to admit what they had done. Right now, in the news, every day there's fights about um, um, critical race theory. That the idea that, oh, America is systemically racist. Well, of course it is. I mean, this is in history. We've been talking about this since the 40s. Like, this is not new. Because the idea, but why won't people admit to it? Well, because there's no truth and reconciliation. You don't have the people saying, I redlined. I made sure our bank didn't invest a dime in mortgages in Bedford Stuyvesant. Or I was the police chief who made sure nothing, no cops were sent to Brownsville. Or the fire chief. Who that's what reconciliation did. Truth and reconciliation. It allowed people to say, this terrible thing happened to me. And then a person who did that got up and said, this is what we did. And they were forgiven. The goal was to create an authoritative narrative of past events and a kind of official history to challenge the previous dominant version. The one that said apartheid was good, that nobody did anything, that they, they only shot terrorists. And in colonial areas, it was to create a national narrative to replace the colonizers narrative. The colonizers, the Europeans were in charge, so they got to make the history. And so it was a way for the colonized, for the natives, for the, for the people, the indigenous people to claim back their history and say, this is what happened to give dignity to the abuse. And what it did was allow South Africans to transition from apartheid to democracy without mass violence, without revenge. And it became the model for truth commissions since. And only someone of Mandela's um, gravitas, legitimacy could do that. Because there were a whole lot of people who said, let's have it. We're going to have some violence now. We're in charge. Bottom rail on top, man. We're going to take your homes, we're going to take your farms, we're going to take your businesses, we're going to take it all, and we're going to give it to us. Move, Whitey. Get out the way. Get out the way, White. Get out the way. Move, White. There's a lot of people who wanted, who wanted, and they had a long, this is true in, in, in Ireland as well, a long history of oppression. They had every right to revenge. And there's Mandela saying, no, we are not going to have revenge. It will be a cycle of vengeance that will just ruin our country.
And what happened? South Africa peacefully transitioned, and it's still one of the wealthiest, unlike what happened in Kenya or Algeria, South Africa remains one of the wealthiest countries in Africa. And so that's where we're going to end. Um, so we start with violence. The Europeans leave and there's lots of violence that the Europeans more or less caused. Uh, there's violence that the United States and USSR basically maintained. After the um, end of the Cold War in the 1990s, we start to get um, Africa getting its feet under it, under their countries. There's different countries become more democratic. Um, they become more stable. The United States does some investment. Uh, Europe does some investment, but China is the big investor now. Um, that's their global play. The soft power of China is not in Asia. It's in Africa. Um, trying to get Africans to like China. They're building roads, they're building railroads. And Africa is developing. Uh, its biggest problem is climate change, that it cannot make climate. It is It will be affected the worst by climate change, and it can do nothing to stop it. Climate change is being caused by China, the United States, and Europe uh, predominantly. And Africa is, no matter what the 50-plus countries can do, will have minimum results on um droughts on rainfall on hurricanes on on monsoons on all the things that happen um that are going to devastate people in the future so thank you be safe